Good evening, everyone. My name is Joffre Linderblau. I'm the director of the Program for Jewish Civilization at Georgetown University. And I want to welcome all of you tonight and thank you for coming out on Erev, Erev, Rosh Hashanah. And before we forget, Shana Tova to all those who will be celebrating the new year. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, our good friends over in Syria, <coughs> as well as the English department. I know we have some English majors sitting in the audience. We have Professor Rosenblatt from the English department, so thanks to them as well. Uh, after tonight's event, we will have a quick, sweet, short book signing. Uh, you have my endorsement, and I urge you to purchase these books because they're, they're truly stellar, and uh, Ms. Vapniar has kindly agreed to sign them after we're done. Our guest today, in my opinion, is one of the most accomplished short story writers working today uh, in the United States. She is the author of three collections, two collections and a novel. The first is the 2003 There Are Jews in My House, a collection of short stories. The second is the 2006 novel Memoirs of a Muse. And the most recent is the 2008 Broccoli and Other Tales of Food and Love. She is a major talent, an absolute delight to read, and really quite a very fun person in person. So without further ado, could we all welcome Ms. Lara Vapniar. Thank you, Jacques, and thank you, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. So I guess the first thing I want to ask you is just if you could tell us just a little bit about your biography as it pertains to the art you create. So a kind of a quick overview of who Lara Vapniar is for those who might not know you. Mm, I was born and grew up in the Soviet Union. And um, when I, uh, people ask me questions about my heritage and it's, um, I usually describe myself as a Russian, Jewish, American writer, but uh, I often omit one very significant word, and I think it just has so much importance for my, uh, for who I am. I'm also a very Soviet person. A very Soviet person? Yes. What's the definition of a very Soviet person? Um, a very Soviet person is somebody who knows certain skills for survival, hmm. for example, how to cut a line and things like that. <laughs> like a very Italian person, right? <laughs> and how do those skills, how do they translate when you came across uh, the big ocean to the United States? What were some Soviet skills that you immediately had to deploy when you arrived in New York? Um, I think I'm best in New York City um, on, on a subway. Just nobody can fit into a crowded train with uh, such precision and skill as I can. <laughs> Good. Excellent. That's quite a New York skill uh, that you learn. And cutting in line, you're also quite good at that. Oh, yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> uh, and you chose to settle initially, your family settled in the most important of the five boroughs, and that borough would be? Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and we found out in our discussions that we actually lived, I'm not sure if it, it was at the same time, about eight blocks, nine blocks from one another. Uh, I knew this from your fiction. If you please look at your program, we have some wonderful quotes from her work. And uh, Lara has asked me to do the reading. I'm going to offer you one more time. Would you like to do the reading? Or no. would, I don't want to mangle your beautiful prose. You sure? Okay. I, I don't want to mangle my beautiful prose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off. For those of you that know Brooklyn, uh, this is beautifully rendered. On Sheepshead Bay, they didn't stop to look at the ships. They crossed the creaky wooden bridge and proceeded along the embankment, passing fishermen, tall trees, and chipped green benches occupied by lonely-looking women. Uh, that quote comes from Mistress when... Yes, it's from um, short story Mistress, but it was included in the collection. In the co right. Uh, and uh, if you could just refresh our audience's memory, uh, what happens in Mistress? In Mistress, um, there is an old Russian immigrant who is very unhappy with America and with his family. And he finally um, realizes that the only way to happiness is to find a mistress. Right, and he finds her at English lessons, of course. Yes. Right? And, um, you know, I used to teach uh, at Niana, which was an organization that taught Russian immigrants English, and Gary Steingart, who we've had here before, taught there as well. And you were a student at Niana as well. Yes. And 
what doesn't happen in English classes for Soviet immigrants? It seems that everything seems... It's such a crazy right. sex place. Yeah, it is. <laughs> English classes. It is. That was noted as well. The second <laughs> quote, which is really quite beautiful, um, and I lived, I grew up, grew up two blocks away from here. This is Avenue M in uh, Brooklyn, uh, and I'm going to read it, but stop me if I mangle too much, okay? On the street with the unimaginative name Avenue M, they walked through narrow stores that all looked alike to Nina, no matter what they sold, food, electronics, clothes, or hardware. After a while, it seemed that they were walking in and out of the same store over and over uh, just to hear the chime of its bell. The February morning was cold and the sunlight was pale. Nina hid her reddened nose in the fur collar of her Russian coat. She clutched her husband's elbow and carefully stepped over piles of garbage, reluctant to look up or sideways at the ashen sky or the motley signs of the shops. We're both Brooklyn people. What's beautiful in Brooklyn? And there's some beauty there. It's there's oh, some beauty. The ocean. The, the beaches. ocean is beautiful. But what about like humanly created Brooklyn? Is there anything that you find architecturally or an avenue that redeems us in a Dostoevskyan sense? Well, in that part of Brooklyn, um, as the character of my story, I found the most beautiful thing: uh, the vegetable stores. Mm. Of course, there weren't a lot of um, interesting vegetables and fruit in Russia. So that was the most exciting thing for me. Russian women in the neighborhood have the habit of always touching the fruit. Did yes. you molest the fruit in that, in that way? Gently. 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 <laughs> What's the purpose of touching the fruit? I never quite figured it out. Is, can you really tactically, I mean with your fingers, assess freshness of vegetables? Th that's amazing because I actually have this Soviet skill of picking the right fruit uh, when uh, there were no fruit in the Soviet Union. So I just. <laughs> <laughs> don't know where it comes from. Yes, you um, you feel how ripe it is and uh, how juicy it is, and sometimes you can even tell by touching how sweet it is. Mm. Um, many of those immigrants arrived in the late 70s and early 80s, and as we're going to find out, Ms. Fafniar arrived a little bit later. Um, they really left quite a mark on that part of Brooklyn, southern Brooklyn. Um, are you nostalgic for it? Do you want to go back? Do you love it? Do you miss it? Or goodbye to all that? Um, I'm not nostalgic about Brooklyn because mm, I used to be nostalgic about Russia, but not, not even real Russia, but Russia of my childhood. And uh, sometimes people just, uh, Russian people, come to Brooklyn because they have to, um, they're looking for traces of Russia in Brooklyn. but. Uh, it's not real Russian. Uh, some parts of Brooklyn, like Brighton Beach, it's uh, more like a parody of Russia than real thing. Is it a little bit like Odessa? Some, some have mentioned that to me. I've never been to Odessa, but uh, a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you ever live in Brighton Beach? Uh, no, but I worked there. You worked there. Okay, great. Um, what's really interesting about you, and I don't quite understand how you pulled this off. So in 1994 or 95, you came to the United States, correct? Yes. And eight years later, you write an acclaimed collection of short stories in English. Um, the only other writer I know who pulled this off was Nabokov. I mean, there are very few that wrote in one language and then came over and wrote in English the way you. How is that possible? How is that even humanly possible? Uh, there is a system for that. Uh, first, I learned uh, how to read in English, which was very hard. And my mother helped me. Uh, she, my, my mother didn't know English, but when we came to Brooklyn, her passion was to pick up books uh, over sidewalks. You know, when people are throwing out their books, they don't just put them into garbage because they have too much respect for books, but uh, put them in neat piles on sidewalk. And my mother would just take everything and uh, bring the books home, and I would try to read them. And since the books were so diverse, um, I could choose anything I wanted. And I, I think um, there was one book by Henry James, which I hated because I absolutely couldn't understand anything at all. And Jane Austen, uh, I, I, I read her in Russian and I loved her, but she just turned out so horrible in English. <laughs> <laughs> but the author that um, I liked in English, the first writer that I was actually able to read was Daniel Steele. <laughs> because I felt so powerful when I read her. I felt, um, first of all, I, I could understand, 
and I felt so much smarter than she was. And for a recent immigrant, that's very important. <laughs> yeah, in Memoirs of a Muse, the muse Tanya learns English and spends her day reading what we would call lowbrow or middlebrow fiction. Is there fictional genius or fictional integrity occasionally in some of these works? You who come from a tradition of Chekhov and Pushkin and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. No. No. <laughs> Nothing. It's just beach reading. Simple beach reading. Yes. Okay. And it improves one's language skills. Oh, yes. It? Fantastic. You wrote a beautiful story, um, Luda and Milena. We're going to read a quote from it uh, right now. And um, this, I think with really good writers such as Lara, uh, lines from their prose appear in your thought process on the subway or six hours later. So the line which really cracked me up, we have staged this, we rehearsed this for two hours together. It's um, number three, are you ready? Okay, uh, breathing exercises, and here we go. Angry and frustrated, Luda had to run all the way to Brooklyn College, pushing through the rush hour subway crowd and cutting across the meat market on Nostrad Avenue, which led to the following exchange with a large woman in a pink jacket. Watch it, asshole. No, it is you, asshole. <laughs> All right, so we're going to look at two types of Russians uh, in your literature. The first are these Russians in exile who seem to stagger around. This is what they look like. They stagger around Brooklyn completely disoriented, like, what the hell just happened to me? And I've looked at this for decades, and I find it very amusing, especially the, the old babushkas who are kind of shambling up and down. And I look at them, and I think each one has an opera in them. I mean, there's some grand tale in all these women in particular, the older women. I don't know if they were there at the Siege of Leningrad. I don't know what it is, right? Um, they're very fictionally compelling, aren't they? The, the Russian women, the older Russian women. Yeah. And uh, you seem to have an interest in them and the kind of like Generation X or Millennials, these kind of younger Russians that are just like 25, 26, working terrible jobs and kind of hanging out in Brooklyn. We see that um, in your story, uh, Borscht, if I'm not mistaken, with Sergi. Mm -hmm. um, who has the better stories in them, the 26-year-olds or the babushkas? Mm, babushkas uh, definitely have uh, longer stories, so. <laughs> but uh, I, I can't say who has the more interesting ones. And when you look for stories, um, do you speak to people or are these things that you just lived or do you ever have informants in the community mm -hmm. that tell you something that you want to write about? No, I, I don't have to have informants because people are just so um, eager to tell their stories. Mm. Hmm. And they don't mind if you devote them to fiction and publish them? Oh, no, no. no. Cool. Interesting. All right, tell us about Sergi. This is the way, you're a great sex writer. We will get into that. It's Erev, Erev Rosh Hashanah, after all, right? Um, and I very much like the opening to one of your stories, and unfortunately it's not... Here. So will. It's in Borscht. Luckily, we have the emergency text right here. It's the very first line. Sergi woke up with an erection and a headache. The first was soon gone, but the second lingered, radiating jagged rings of pain from a point of distress somewhere in the center of his skull. Sergi is kind of um, this Russian slacker that I spoke about who's just kind of floating through life in Brooklyn. Can you tell us a little bit about his story in this text? Um. Actually, this is a very common story. Uh, then uh, people uh, come to the United States and stay there illegally, and uh, they work very hard jobs, like uh, Sergei's in construction, and um, a lot of women come and they work as babysitters, and they have to leave their families in Russia. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard on them. And they often had like, advanced degrees in the former Soviet Union, correct? Yes. Many of them were like physicists. And yes, some of them. Yeah. Uh, this is tragic. I mean, it's actually it's it really is. tragic. It's a story we saw a lot in Brooklyn, that many of the people that would work even around my parents' house were, were actually physicists or chemists, and they were working as uh, lower-level medical technicians, uh, checking blood pressure. Yeah. Or th so what is this? What does this do to the community or the moral, the moral standing of the community? Um, does it lead to alcoholism? Does it lead to despair? Do, do they double down on the hope? Uh, well, I happen to know a lot of doctors who treat um, these particular types of people and uh, depression is mm. uh, number one thing among them. 
the, the and impotence, impotence right. among men. And impotence in the men. Huh. And that's what the doctors tell you? Yes. They share that with you? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Russian doctors? American doctors? Of course, Russian doctors. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it just seems that there's. Patient. We don't have any ethical problems. All right. Patient doctor <laughs> confidentiality would seem to. Um, one thing that we were discussing at lunch and we were snickering about this is in a lot of the contemporary Russian Jewish American fiction, uh, there's Lara Vatnyar, there's Gary Steingart, David Bismoskis, the big three. Uh, there's a scene of looking at an Anglo-Jew or an Anglicized Jew. And tell us about Mark, this hideous character that floats through, and I regret to say I think sucked the air out of the very wonderful memoirs of a muse. Tell us a little bit about Mark, and then we'll, we'll follow up on that. Well, my, my main character of my novel wants to meet somebody like Dostoevsky and become his muse. Because it's no fun to become a muse to somebody, to a lesser writer than Dostoevsky. And um, since she comes to United States, she, she can only meet an American writer. And since she cannot read English very well, uh, she can judge for herself how great this writer is. So she makes a mistake and uh, she becomes amused to somebody not as great as Dostoevsky. And um, I uh, described this writer through the eyes of this character who is watching his everyday life and records his every movement uh, because she thinks that it might be important when he becomes as great as Dostoevsky. And so um, what happened that is his portrayal is um, kind of like you, um, like a pretty disgusting animal that is very closely watched. So mm -hmm. that's what happened mm -hmm. with my character. So the character is, a, he's, he's a self-obsessed boar. Um, and we see similar types in Steingart. Uh, those of you familiar with the Russian debutante's handbook, the writer Schwartz, who's this writer he meets in Prague who holds a pen and gives a long lecture, a disquisition on what the pen means to the writer. Uh, Bismosgus with uh, the Canadian Jewish families. Um, why do these Anglos, from the Russian perspective, always look sterile, um, uh, vapid, uh, the epitome of maybe white bread? They look like there's no juice in them, no garlic, no spice. Why do you, are we really that bad? And I'm not even in that cohort, but are American Jews that vanilla? Um, one, explan one obvious explanation for that is that maybe they are, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really I've been thinking a lot about this and uh, I think that just, I, I, I can't speak for other writers, I can only speak for myself. <coughs> I feel that when I um, write this American character, something is missing. Something is not natural for me. Uh, when I write my Russian characters, it, it comes very naturally. And uh, um, the only comparison I can come up with is like um, mother's milk and formula. In formula, all the chemical elements are there, but something's missing, something very important, the soul of a character is missing. And maybe that's why my American character is just not there. Yeah, um, the penchant for drama, the, the classic Russian soul, that maybe that's a yes. stereotype. It's not there, you're it's right, it, there. it's absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's possibly not because Americans lack that mysterious, uh, strange, dramatic soul, but just I can't capture it. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, do you think it's a historical um, problematic that there's just nothing in American history comparable to what happened in the Soviet Union? You had a pretty tragic run there from 19... Forget 1917, from the 16th century forward. It's a, it's a difficult trajectory. I, I just think it, it's my perspective of a foreigner. I, I mean, a, a writer who was born in America probably would be much better at capturing American soul. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't see it and I don't feel it, I just, it's very difficult for me to capture it. But I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have you ever said to yourself, the American expression, it's better this way? Have you ever looked at the kind of serenity and calm that surrounds so many young American Jewish men without the drama, without the alcoholism, without all the things you write about? You know, 
Maybe they're on to something. Maybe, maybe boring is better or never. No. Boring is never better. No. Not for literature, anyway. Uh, in my personal life, it's, uh, it's, it's the same thing. Meaning? I'm sorry. Uh, I would choose anything over boring. Everything over boring, okay. Painful over boring. Painful over boring, anytime. Anytime. Okay. Um, let's go to Russians in Russia. Uh, and here the problematics darken uh, considerably. I'm struck by the, the theme of anti-Semitism in so much of your work um, and the kind of visceral, visceral uh, kind of tincture to it all. I'm going to read a line, my text is different, that you wrote about Chekhov, uh, one of your favorite writers. Yeah. And uh, here we go, my literary crushes. Are you sure you don't want to read it? No. You, probably, you, you do such a better job than I do. Okay. I identified, we're on num quote number five, everybody. I identified with every Chekhov character. I was Gurov, I was Anna Sergeyevna, I was the circus dog Kashtanka. It was perfect, untroubled romance until I read Rothschild's Fiddle. Despite its name, the story isn't about Rothschild, but about Yakov, a Russian undertaker. Rothschild is a minor figure in the story, just a little Jew. Not a bad man, but a ridiculous, pathetic man. Now here was a Chekhov character with whom I didn't want to identify, but I couldn't help but identify with him. He was a Jew, just as I was. I discovered many other Jews in Chekhov's stories. They were never evil, but they were unfailingly small, incapable of grandeur. That was how Chekhov saw Jews. Beautifully written paragraph. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Um, it's actually very painful because uh, for Russian Jews, we grew up uh, on reading this uh, classic Russian literature, and uh, it just meant so much for us. I was, uh, well, my, it was not just a literary crush. I, I think I have a real crush on Chekhov. And <laughs> it, he is just, uh, I think he, he's my favorite writer. And he's wonderful in every way. But how can I reconcile with how uh, he portrayed Jews? It's, it's very painful. And still, I can't uh, reconcile with it. I mean, if you doubt uh, how Chekhov portrayed Jews, well, read this story. And uh, also, in our story, um, I, I, I don't know how to translate. It's probably, tr uh, in English, it's probably Meyer. It's about this really ugly, obnoxious, devious Jewish woman who sleeps with men and then uh, robs them. So Chekhov was a <coughs> real anti-Semite. But it doesn't make him a lesser writer. So it's very difficult to admire somebody so much and at the same time see him for what he was. Now, you give us in your writings very intense portraiture of anti-Semites. And the one I want to discuss in particular, and it might be your best known work, is Galina uh, in There Are Jews in My House. So uh, I'll leave it to you to kind of set the stage a little bit about Galina and Raya's relationship. This is a, an absolutely incandescent story. Um, and what I love about that story is I really feel suffocated. I don't know how you did that, but I feel there's like no physical space in that hiding space that they're situated in. Can you please tell us a little bit about it? Um, I, I'm not a historian, so I can't really talk about roots of anti-Semitism in Russia and how it came about. But I just wrote about what I saw and what I felt myself and what my um, mother and grandmother told me to ho how it used to be. There is just such intense um, physical hatred of Jews in some people. It's just something that comes from within. I, I, in my story, it's, um, it's a woman who is uh, a Russian woman who is deeply unhappy. And somehow she is brought up to think that um, uh, whatever happens to you, it's, uh, it's somehow a fault of Jews. Look at what uh, it's um, for me. Uh, Anti-Semitism story is uh, about jealousy, uh, more than about jealousy than anything else. Jews have something. Uh, uh, Jews have something that this woman doesn't, and uh, this hatred grows more and more until she's ready to kill. 
What I found interesting in the story is in Steingart's Russian debutante's handbook where there's a character who's deeply anti-Semitic, there, there seems to be a connection between anti-Semitism and the Orthodox Church. Uh, what was it? I forget the character's name. Um, Stolia or something like that, who was constantly trying to take him to church and get the Jew out of him. Right? In your writing, I see a somewhat different um, explanation, and it's Slavicness. I was very um, taken by the fact that Galina is depicted as a kind of Sla in a Slavic marble statue, right? The essence of the Slavic woman. And Galina is perhaps one of the most anti Semitic characters we've seen since like Trollope or T.S. Eliot. That is really a portrait of anti Semitism. So is there a connection between Slavicness and anti Semitism? As distinct from Orthodoxy, the Orthodox Church, and anti Semitism? Well, I think the anti-Semitism that comes from a church is not as bad because you can kind of explain it because people were brainwashed. But uh, anti-Semitism that comes from within a secular society is just so much worse because it comes from something, uh, some anger inside of people. Uh, I don't know if um, Slavic people are particularly anti-Semitic. It just, uh, there is also another thing is that uh, in Russia people suffered greatly un under the Soviet rule and this also were some, uh, was somehow blamed on the Jews. Hmm. All right, so you have in that story Galina and Raya. Galina is this Slavic marble statue who is hiding Raya and her daughter. And it seems slowly, slowly we start to understand that Raya has certain Jewish characteristics from the point of view of an anti-Semite. So I'll name one and then you can, she talks a lot, for example, right? She won't stop talking except for when the tram stops for some reason, right? Would you like to name some of these other classic anti-Semitic stereotypes that Galina attaches to her? I have them all in my mind if you want me to. Mm. She's oversexed. Is there something Jewish? Well, yeah, that's a classic stereotype of well, the Jew. Well, you, you're an right. expert on Philip Roth, so of course yeah. you <laughs> And you can't get more oversexed than Philip Roth. Um, she, uh, she indulges in these affairs. She's not guilty about extramarital sexual contact. Oh, yes, yes. Um, she cheats on her husband. Cheating is, of course, something Jewish. So here's the line that... Uh, Lying, cheating, mm -hmm. stealing, you name it. Uh, yeah, but she's a great character. I mean, she's not a bad person, Raya. It's all seen through the optic of Galina, who has decades, if not centuries, of anti-Semitism being pumped into her, ostensibly by her mother, I think. So we're going to read one of the quotes uh, right here. Uh, it's quote number eight, everybody. And this is Galina's, well, Galina's stream of consciousness through the narrative voice. Okay. Uh, there are Jewish graves. Look at them. And then look at ours. Galina stood up, shaking the crumbs off her starched Easter dress and walked to the fence. There she moved the dense branches of a young maple tree away from her face and looked. Look what the Jews have, daughter, Galina's mother repeated. She saw iron fences painted black and inside the fences fragile shoots of young violets and forget-me-nots struggling through the heavy dark soil. She saw gravestones. They were small but made of real stone, each of them with a crooked, wrongly shaped star. Now look what we have. Galina stepped away from the fence and looked around. Lopsided crosses made of rotting wood, paper reeds, and eggshell, a sea of colored eggshell. On the way back, Galina was tired and sleepy and had to lean on her mother's hip. Her mother's words were coming from above and seemed to bundle up Galina's head like a heavy warm shawl. Remember, Galina, Jews get everything. They have ways. Did you ever encounter anything like that personally? Yes, I uh, actually overheard this conversation. You overheard this conversation? Yes. Where? In the cemetery? In the cemetery. Uh, there was a... It's... Um, it, it was in the cemetery where uh, my father is buried. And uh, there was a Jewish part and a Russian part. And they look significantly different. Jewish part have uh, big, beautiful gravestones. And Russian part has this rotting crosses. And uh, um, I asked my mother. So, so there was actually two conversations, a, a Jewish girl and her mother, so m my mother and me. And uh, later I overheard a conversation between a Russian girl and her mother. So my mother explained the difference between gravestones is that uh, Jews respected their dead and they mm, wouldn't spare money to erected beautiful gravestones. And Russians just uh, spent all their money on Vodka. 
And <laughs> so um, there are stereotypes going both ways. And uh, that Russian woman explained to her daughter um, almost exactly what they said. But Jews are rich. They get everything, and they get stuff from us Russians. So look what they have. You ever feel, or do you have a desire to go back? Do you go back? Um, I went there twice. Twice uh, to kind of close up some family affairs, or out of a sheer desire to see what it was like. Many people go back to visit a grave, or there's some financial affairs they have to rectify. No, actually, I was invited by an uh, American embassy to speak there as an American writer, okay. oh. which was uh, very funny. And I'm taking it you're, you're not particularly optimistic about the future of the country, the Russia at present, or do you think it's, it's just doing fine? My sense is a, a, a looming sense of dread amongst folks like you about the future of Russia. Oh, yes, definitely a sense of dread about the future of Russia, but that doesn't pain me as much as the sense of dread over the future of America. Ah, okay. <laughs> what, what, what's going on here? What's worrying you about the United States? <laughs> 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 okay. Um, so just in terms of your, um, you know, hot or not, you mentioned Chekhov. Uh, Dostoevsky, uh, did you have a crush on Dostoevsky? Definitely not, but mm -hmm. uh, um, not, not on Dostoevsky as a sexual object, but um, I, I think he's a really great writer. All right, how about, um, I don't know, Pushkin? Pushkin is good. Who wrote uh, The Mistress and Margarita? Bulgakov. Uh, yeah, crush on him? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, he's a, he's, he, he, he's a martyr, actually. He's a literary martyr, if I understand correctly. He just disappeared, right? Um, I, I think he's very interesting, and it's a good book. I just don't uh, think it's uh, such a great book. All right, and going back a little bit, Tolstoy, you've expressed... To Tolstoy is number oh, one. Crush? Crush on Tolstoy? No, no, no crush on Tolstoy. No. How can you possibly have a crush on Tolstoy? But okay. uh, he, uh, I think he's the greatest writer. Right. I, I did read you saying you found him a little bit windy and kind of didactic in his prose, as if he were always lecturing you, uh, lecturing yes, the reader. Yes, yes, uh, that's absolutely true, and I hate it about Tolstoy, but what, um, what he does great is just so great that it absolutely doesn't matter uh, uh, these little things that um, uh, can be annoying about Tolstoy. I think he's still the, the greatest. All right, uh, let's start winding it down uh, very quickly. You're a great sex writer. Um, you write about mistresses, you write about muses, you write about affairs, and you do so without any apologies or any excuses. Good for you. Uh, may you live long. Philip Roth would give you his blessing, <laughs> or maybe he'd give you something else. Um, let's quickly go to, let's go to quote number 10. Um, here we go. And I remember teaching this to my students. Uh, you know what he told me yesterday, she asked. Galena silently groaned, preparing to hear another sloppy compliment. But she wasn't prepared for this. He said, Raya said it slowly, emphasizing every word, that my, you know, she glanced down at those words, taste like red currant jelly. Then she laughed. Galena felt her whole body go down as if somebody very strong were dragging her to the floor. And at the same time, she felt the heavy round table was tilting in her direction, along with the patties, the glasses, and Raya's purse. I love that scene. Now, Galena is kind of a Slavic Puritan, we should add. There's a puritanical uh, dimension to her as well. Apparently, I am not such a good sex writer because I got many angry letters about this quote that it actually doesn't taste like red currant jelly at all, <laughs> which is true. I just, uh, I wanted to write something beautiful, but it doesn't. Uh, what were some of the alternative tastes that people suggested other than red currant jelly, or maybe we should, yeah. Oysters. Uh, oysters. <laughs> good, okay, very, very, very good. Um, your muse, your muse fails. And I have a theory as to why she fails. But why does the muse fail? Why does Tanya the muse not manage? Uh, the young man that she lives with, Mark, uh, writes a terrible book. The prose is dead. And you even show us a snippet, the opening line, which is a complete disaster. What went wrong there? 
Well, actually, I don't believe in muses. I think if somebody is talented, he will uh, do something great. It doesn't matter what happens in his personal life. But it's such an attractive idea uh, to think of yourself of um, uh, that uh, you are capable to inspire somebody mm -hmm. to write something great. I personally don't buy it at all. You really um, lock us in on the kind of creepy dimensions of the sexual relationship between a very, not a very, but an old man and a young woman. Uh, that comes across in your descriptions. Of, is that Polina, the muse for Dostoevsky? Um, some of those descriptions are really jarring, right? The young flesh of the 19, 20, 21 year old woman and this kind of, I don't know, decrepit old man kind of panting like an animal at this young girl. Um, is it always like that in the muse, love, in the muse writer um, situation? Does it always play out like that? Mm. As in the writer is just uh, physically reprehensible, whereas the muse is always physically desirable. Are there other possibilities that? The older man, uh, from point of view of a young girl, mm -hmm. is pretty much always physically not there. Reprehensible. Yes. Reprehensible, OK. Good to know. All right, so let's, as we, as we wind it down, um, very quickly, you, uh, we didn't mention this yet, but um, Ms. Vapniar is completing her doctorate uh, at City University of New York, and your specialty is immigrant literature, and you're in that, that um, class of immigrant lit writers. And we were discussing at lunch, has immigrant literature, there's an expression in English, jump the shark, or has it become a bit of a cliche, or is it time to move forward? Because there are a lot of great uh, immigrant lit writers. So how much more is left in this genre, which exploded in the mid-90s, of immigrant lit? Uh, I can tell for other writers, but uh, I feel that I'm tired of uh, the immigrant theme myself. Mm -hmm. I would rather write, uh, well, I, I, do, I don't really have a choice because as I said before, I don't uh, write excellent American characters mm -hmm. or I can't write them yet. I'm working on it. So uh, I end up writing Russian characters and sometimes I try to translate them into Americans. Well, I, I have some, somebody Russian in mind so I could capture his soul, but I make them American. And it's, uh, it doesn't quite work. But uh, I do try to kind of steer away from immigrant theme. And do you think maybe the possibilities of the genre, maybe even commercially, have exhausted themselves? Or is there a lot more to mine? Or there's so much more we can write about in these stories? Uh, I think there are just too many books exploring immigrant theme. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, writers should uh, take a break for a while, for uh, hundred years or so, <laughs> and then it it, uh, it will be very original and interesting again. Hundred years of, of solitude or of silence. Um, <laughs> another question I want to ask you is this: uh, I keep uh, encountering, since I work on Philip Roth, right, I keep encountering Philip's um, fear that the novel as we know it is poised to die in twenty-five years, and nobody's going to be reading literature ever again. And it seems a little bit shrill. Nevertheless, I'm hearing it. I heard it from Gary Steingart, where he doubts in Super Sad Love Story. That's what his sub-theme is, that nobody reads books in the future. Is that something you lose sleep over at night, the possibility that there won't be serious literature a few decades down the road? No, not at all. There'll always be readers and there'll always be writers. No, I just don't care. You don't care? <laughs> Why? Um, just It's uh, very hard to look into the future. I worry about what happens now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and let me ask you one final question. Your next project, your next book will be, what are you, what are you thinking about these days? Uh, I'm thinking of writing a novel about Staten Island. It's uh, the place where I live and it's an amazing place and few people know about it. It's just, it's famous uh, because it has, uh, it used to have the biggest dump in the United States. And I think it just Fascinating to write um, about a place that has the biggest dump in the United States. Fresh Kills? Yes. Fresh Kills landfill. Does it still smell? It used to, we could smell it in Brooklyn, but does it still, they covered it over, right? Uh, they covered it over, but all the garbage is there. And uh, the most tragic and painful thing that I could think of 
the rem remains of people uh, who died uh, during September 11 are still there. And right now they're building a playground and huge park and all this stuff right over mm. that. So they moved, that's right, it was a so transfer all station. Yeah. The garbage is still there, it's just covered and so they're building stuff hmm. on top of it. All right, and are, are you full of writerly energy right now? Are you enthused or are you yeah, yeah. writing every day? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, so then I'll deliver uh, an unsolicited endorsement. Uh, in the hallway, we have copies of uh, a few of her works. And the recent work, um, it's this one right over here, uh, Broccoli and Other Tales of Food and Love, which ends off with recipes right? uh, and features a story in which two Russian women argue and fight over the affections of a man and engage in a meatball contest. <laughs> and spoiler alert, how does it end? What happens with that meatball? I just tell you one thing that I call uh, my meatball recipe killer meatballs. Killer meatballs, <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Right. Pity the poor Jewish pensioner that eats those meatballs. Ms. Vapnyar, I want to thank you so much. I think thank you're the you. best. And thank you all tonight.